All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. I want to start with uh, a little quote I found from His Holiness the Dalai Lama that I really liked. Um, and in it, uh, he says, man sacrifices his health in order to make money. And then he sacrifices his money to recuperate his health. Then he is so anxious about the future that he doesn't enjoy the present, the result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die, and then he dies never having really lived. Wow, talk about a rock and a hard place, huh? <laughs> uh, you know? Uh, but you know, then Henry David Thoreau, one of the uh, American transcendentalists, uh, said this. He said, the question is not what you look at, but what you see. So today I'm going to talk about letting the spirit work. And you know, in the science of mind, we talk a lot about how we are in a co-creative relationship with God. God doesn't just do it to us. Like, you know, uh, in ancient Greece, they believed that Zeus sat up high on a mountain with a bucket of lightning bolts and would, you know, shoot them down at you if you misbehaved and things like that. So we don't, we don't subscribe to that. God doesn't do it to us. We are in this co-creative relationship. So our job is always around us creating the container, the container being our consciousness, so that some greater good is able to come forward in our life. Because the principles never change. The principles that we work with are eternally true. They, uh, and, and they, they um, typify that idea that we talk about so much that what's true about God is also true about me. Ernest Holmes said this, he said, man must become more if he wishes to draw a greater good into his life. We have to become more if we want to be healthier, if we want to be more prosperous, if we want to have greater love in our life. And he says, so the untapped power, I think, is always there. But what happens is we start, uh, and I think this is a very human tendency, I watch my dogs do it all the time, we start going in circles, you know? We get busy living our life, and we kind of go on automatic pilot, and we're going around and around and around. And what is that? What is, oh, that's my tail I'm chasing, exactly. So I think, you know, it's easy that we would become mechanical thinking the same old things, that we'd become mechanical uh, reacting the same old way. You know, how many of us drive the same way someplace all the time, almost all the time? I do it. I do it. And, you know, uh, or find myself eating the exact same thing over and over again, watching the same shows maybe, you know. Uh, uh, it's, it's powerful. I think it's a powerful use of principle to have a new vision, a new image of yourself. Because as a spiritual being, each and every one of us, we have infinite options. Infinite options. And I think that's extraordinary. So what am I aware of today would be the first thing I'd have to ask myself. What does my power of perception focus on? Because I'm always getting more of that. So I may focus on what is comfortable. I may focus on what is familiar. That doesn't mean that that's all there is. You know, I think of it like this, that in the infinite mind of God, there are lots of frequencies broadcasting that I am not tuned into. And they're broadcasting right now. I just don't hear them. I don't have the eyes uh, or the spiritual equipment today to experience those things. But there is within each of us, for certain, an untapped, uh, a reservoir of untapped power. And it's always there waiting to be used, waiting to be accessed, waiting to be called forward into expression. A man said to me, he said, I, said, I don't like who I am. Where do I begin? Wow, that's a good question. That's a good question. And so you start with, I would say, a new image of yourself. Move mentally from the old pattern of thought and see yourself as more. Like, who is the person I really want to be? How do I want to be in situations? How do I want to be as a partner in relationship? How do I want to, I want to be as a worker at my job? How do I want to be as a neighbor in my community? You know, God in you is always more than we are giving access to. So if you see yourself as the person you desire to be, and we do this daily, this will start to take root in our subconscious mind and begin to appear, that we start to become this new image. You know, in small ways, I think we begin to act a little bit differently because we're thinking differently about who we are. You know, so one of the things I said to myself was, well, if I were a person who was incredibly patient, how would I be here? You know, if I were a person who had compassion, how would I be here? Because, you know, sometimes it feels like we don't have the resources within us. And so I have to play a little game with my mind and say, well, if I were that person, how would I be? You know, that you will notice, you know, I don't, uh, well, anyway, so, so let me tell you. So I have um, an aunt I was very close to growing up. 
Uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful person. I loved her very much. I spent a lot of time with her. And uh, at some point, when she was very young, obviously long before I got on the planet, um, she had uh, acquired some physical challenge. Uh, and she believed, um, and this was really significant to me, that she believed that her challenge was a punishment from God. And, um, and I would look at her and i think, God, she's so good. She's so kind. She's loving. She's helpful. Uh, goes to church all the time. Does the good works. All that stuff. I just, and, and I think this was important for me in my own development because I couldn't get behind how God would assign this punishment to her. Because seeing her as often as I did, I thought, well, she's just this wonderful, loving person. She's very, very good. And I thought, it just didn't fit with my idea of what God would be, could be, should be. You know? So I asked her you know, what she did. I remember asking her what she did that was so bad that, in a very innocent way, I was honest to God, I was not being a smart aleck. Uh, uh, you know, what she did that was so bad that God uh, would, would punish her with this. You know? uh, and, uh, and she didn't have an answer for that. All she could say was, well, you know, I must have done something or uh, he wouldn't have punished me. Um, and I remember later in life when I would say to her, well, you know, there are things that could help you, that could make you more comfortable, that could make your life better. She would say, no, God sent this to me. I'm supposed to deal with it. And that was, that was really a heartbreaking thing for me. You know, that was really, really heartbreaking. See, because what we teach in the science of mind is that the will of God is always good. It is everything that expresses life without hurt. Now, Ernest Holmes said that anything that will enable us to express greater life, greater happiness, greater power, so long as it not, does not harm anyone else, is the will of God. So today I would stand here in front of you and I would say, I absolutely do not believe what she believed. And she's totally entitled to her belief. And she still operates under that today. Um, but I don't believe that's so. I don't think that God sends punishments, and I don't think that God sends rewards. I think God is being God, doing everything that God's going to do right now, 100%, fully and completely, and we create the container for the greater good. Mm -hmm. The principle is not limited. So I'm really happy now that I don't have a punishing God, that we're not punished for our past, our past mistakes, our past errors or sins or whatever we might call them. I think there are consequences for them. That's just cause and effect, though. To think God is punishing me or to think that God punishes us, I would say that's a false belief. God has better things to do than keep track of your mistakes, your errors. You know that ignorance is always what prevents our healing. Ignorance of who we really are. Ignorance of what God is. Right? So don't blame God. If you, know, if you have known better and just not done it, I won't ask you to raise your hands. I used to do that a lot. You know? I knew better, didn't do it, and then I wanted to blame God. Right? So everything begins with an idea we teach in the science of mind. An idea is a tremendous thing. And so which ideas are we going to entertain? A new idea filling our mind, a divine idea filling our mind will compel us to express more of the God qualities and, the greater th and, and thereby greater things are able to unfold in our life. I think we have to totally let go of this notion that there are two powers. One that's abundant, one that's lacking. One that's loving and one that's not. One that causes sickness and one that causes healing. See, that thinking has, and this thinking that there's only one has to move from our head down, and you'll know when it does because you will hear kerplunk. You know, it goes kerplunk, head to heart, kerplunk, right? To, to be fully embodied. I think we have to assimilate these truths until they become just a natural part of us. See, I can have these thoughts and ideas but not experience them in my life and body. Now, Emerson said that a man, man is what he thinks about all day long. So I'll ask you this. What do you think about all day long? You know, I mean, all day long. You know, we all have things that we come back to again and again and again and again. Hmm, that's interesting to me. What do I think about all day long? Am I thinking that life is good and people are wonderful and everything gets better and my life gets better every week, every month, every year? You know, or am I thinking, 
damn, my best days are behind me. It's all downhill from here. You know, I just hold on a little longer. You know, see, we create our heaven and we create hell by what we think about. You know, people say to me, you know, I'm in hell in this relationship. What do I do? Well, start by choosing a different thought would be a good thing, you know. A different thought about what? What do you mean? Well, what, what are you thinking about that relationship? Because you're contributing to it, right? That person you're in relationship with, you didn't just wake up one day and there was a farm animal, right? <laughs> Your thinking has been involved in this for a long time. What are you thinking about that relationship? What are you thinking about your partner? What are you thinking about what is possible, right? Because we have choice. We're not compelled to think a certain way. We have the freedom to think good or bad, hmm? to be good or bad, if we will. See, I think we're all faced with making decisions. Not making a decision is also making a decision. Let's be very, very clear. So maybe we hesitate or waver, and that also you know, is in the realm of, OK, well, I just, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. And sometimes it gets decided for us. I trust that life, that God is for me, though. God is for all of us. And anything I need to know is in the mind of God, and I believe is available to me right now. Of course, the hard part is making myself sit down and shut up and close my eyes and listen and just say, God, show me what I need to know. Reveal to me in a way I understand. You know how thick I can be. Show me in a way I can understand and use. See, I have to be still and know, like the scripture says, be still and know that I am God. I'm making myself available and receptive to a higher power within me that knows. You know, Thomas Carlyle once said, silence is the element in which great things fashion themselves. I love that. You know, that great, great stuff comes out of the silence. So it only makes sense to me that we would think good. Good thoughts, good vibes, good frequencies. You know, then good can follow. If we're thinking evil, if we're thinking lack and limitation and confusion, this is a mental universe. And thought grows after its kind. So if you're thinking about that, oh, I don't know, I'm so confused, oh, I don't know, I can't do it, oh, I don't know, I'm so overwhelmed. People tell me they're overwhelmed all the time, and you know what the universe does? The universe says it's too much for you to handle, and it starts to take things away, not because God is punishing, but because it's a cause and effect universe. And when I say, oh, it's too much, I'm overwhelmed, the universe says, well, all right, well, they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed. So even if you have less to do, you're going to still feel overwhelmed because you were saying it all the time. Stop saying it. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah, it does, you know. If, if we do not do our own thinking, the world around us will be glad to do it for us. We'll be influenced by what Ernest Holmes calls the race consciousness, the mass mind that is around us. We're immersed in it. It bombards us constantly. But I have to ask myself, is that enough for me? Do I want for my life what most other people are getting unconsciously? And so I would say, no, it's not. I don't want that. You know, I don't want to kid myself and say, you know, oh, well, God will decide. Because when I face it, that sounds like God out there to me, right? God works for us by working through us. So to think I cannot decide, I think, is actually a rejection of the divinity that is within me. When we say I can't decide, you're saying, okay, God's everywhere, but not in me. Now, that's really diminishing. That's thinking small. It's weak. It's inferior. It's never too late to assert our divinity. You know? So we want to not give our power away. The principle that we're working with is waiting for our, our, us to use it. It's waiting for our direction. You know? So I like to subconsciously give my mind direction. You know, uh, to consciously, I like to consciously give my subconscious mind direction because it's always working on my behalf. Your subconscious mind is always working on your behalf. So unless I direct it, it will continue to reproduce our habitual thinking in, in, into form. It'll take our habitual thinking and make it our physical experience of life. Hmm? So I think about this elderly aunt, and I think about how for... 96 years, she has believed herself to be so bad that she's being punished every day. And I think, what, what a horrible burden to place upon yourself, to, to limit yourself, to hold yourself back, to think that. And you say, well, what, what could you possibly do that's so bad that God would punish you like this? And, and there's no answer for that. 
You know, and so what I see is that it has enormously, enormously limited her life and her expression and her ability to, to be in the world in a, in a more, uh, what I'll call productive, creative way. In the Psalms, it says, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills, from whence cometh my help. So to me, that's talking about the hills are a higher consciousness, the divine that is within me. I will be faithful to a mental picture that's greater than what I have entertained thus far. Right? I will hold a vision that is high. You know, We say all the time here that, um, that awareness is curative. So I will give my awareness to a higher vision for my life, a vision that's, that's healthy, that's prosperous, that's filled with love. So I would ask you to think about what's the vision you hold for your life today. Is it a vision of health? Is it a vision of abundance? Is it a vision of peace that you hold for yourself? You know, is that what I think about in picture? Ask yourself that today. Do I give my wholehearted attention and devotion to it at least a little bit every day? See, this does not displease God. It does not take away from anyone else. I think what it does is it actually is using intelligently the power, the spiritual creative capacity that God has endowed each of us with. When what we think in our head and believe and feel in our hearts are the same thing, when they agree, nothing will be impossible to us. And I think that you know, we will never experience true happiness, true peace, as long as we're believing in two powers, right? Now, you say, but, but it certainly seems like there are two. But the power is neutral. And we individually choose how we set it in motion. I can use the power for good. I can use the power for not good. I can use the power to raise people up. I can use the power to put people down. I can use the power to raise myself up, or I can use the power to diminish myself. You know? So this is, I think, where we really grow and begin to advance spiritually. You know, because we won't have peace and happiness as long as we limit the principle. So does the thing I wish to do express more life, more happiness, and more peace to myself, and at the same time harm no one, if it does, it's right. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment, remembering that right here, the fullness and the allness of God is present. That we are surrounded, we are filled with God's infinite, loving, intelligent spirit. That spirit within us is the most true, most real thing about us. That each and every one of us, we are emanations of the Most High God. And so in this awareness, I speak the word that not only are we one with God, the only power and presence, we are also all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And so I speak this word for us today, that yes, indeed, we let the Spirit work through us. We let it flow, that each and every one of us, we are open, willing vessels for God's expression into the world. And I know that that expression for each and every one of us is health, it's love, it's all needs met, it's creativity, it's joy. It's every good thing. This is absolutely the will of God. And we say yes to it. So anything within us that would hinder this, I speak the word that we surrender that now. We release it, we let it go, and we make room for a greater expression of life in every good and perfect way. And so we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children. Wherever they are, we know God is right there that they are surrounded, that they are filled. We raise them high in consciousness. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. And so thank you, God, that we have a God that's big enough to handle all of it. And so we know that God is present in all of those situations that pull at our attention, all of those situations that make us fearful or doubting or angry or anything like that. God is right there. That means the seeds for love and healing and peace are right there. And we say yes to that. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together today, that there is raising up, there is healing, there is a greater good for each and every one of us, and we say yes to it. So with a full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth, and I release this word. And so it is, together we all say, Amen.